Hi, I'm Paul Marcel. A couple weeks ago, I was browsing a woodworking forum and there were some people talking about a new tool company called Valfor Tools. Now, these guys make just three products for the moment, but they're mostly for setup and layout. So, uh, and they all kind of focus on the router tables. And then a while later, Valfor Tools contacted me and asked me if I would like one of each of their products to give a try, give some feedback on and do a review for. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Now, one of the three I don't actually need to introduce, you've already seen it in a red version. It's the Valfor Tools router bit vise, and this is the same vise that you saw coming out of Woodpeckers as a one-time tool. Now, the patent is actually owned by Valfor Tools, but they licensed it to Woodpeckers to do the one-time tool to kind of bring some money in so they could get some things machined and get the company going. So that's where this vise comes from. So you've all seen this before. It's just a, a heavy vise that you can put a bit in and you can use it to monkey around with the bearings that are on the top and do changes and things like that, maybe even a little bit of sharpening and honing with the diamond file. So I'm not really going to talk too much about this today because these other two are the ones that actually caught my interest the most. Now the other two tools are this two axis depth gauge and then this groove center. Now the groove center caught my eye because the way it works is by directly measuring off of stock. So you never actually take a number. You never take a tape measure and read a number off of it. So it's kind of reminiscent of like the Bridge City KM1 and TM1 where you simply squeeze cutters, squeeze stock, and then it provides the offsets that make everything just work perfectly for you. So this is similar, but it does it in a centering function. Now these two can be used separately, but together they actually provide some interesting functions specifically for a locking miter bit. And we're going to talk about how to use the two of them together for that, but first we'll talk about each of these setup tools separately. Now the height or the depth gauge, very similar to others that you've seen on the market, two legs, and then you've got a rod that comes down and touches whatever it is that you're trying to take a measurement for. Now you've got a sliding piece here that locks the rod in place, so you slide that over, and now it moves very easily, and then you just scoot it over, and then it becomes locked very solidly, in fact. What makes this one special and a little different from some of the other ones that are on the market is that it's two axis. So what do we mean by that? Well, first, of course, we can use this to determine the height of a bit. So we could measure some stock or we can take a, a reading of where we want to be and then put it here and raise the bit until you hit that post. But the nice thing with this one is that these legs are cammed and they can move. So now you can push this up against a fence and you can measure how far a bit is away from a fence. Now with the way that these cams move, it'd be very easy to lower where this registration point is with this rod and then of course raise it back up. So that makes us a little bit more multifunctional. Now the usual things with these rods is you know, there's some graduations on them. They're relatively fat lines. It only goes down to an eighth of an inch. Personally, I would never set the depth gauge according to this graduated rod. But if I did want to set the height of this rod according to a certain specific measurement as opposed to measuring off stock, I would just use, honestly, a drill index. So if for some reason I want this thing a quarter inch or let's go for, hey, 11 30 seconds, that's exactly what I'm needing today. You just put that down on the table and then loosen this up. So you can drop that right onto the rod and now you lock it into place. Now you've got your 11 30 seconds reference. So you can do this with any gauge. It's just to say, uh, to me, I don't put much weight in how good the, the graduations are on the side. So this, they're about the same as anything else. If you wanted to switch this around to use the stubby end, just loosen this up so you can take it out, take it out, put it in the other way, and now you can, of course, lock it in with whatever setting you have to have the stubby end. Now, one of the things I would have liked with this depth gauge and actually any of them, uh, but specifically this one here, since it seems to be designed and geared for a router table, is to have a way to reach in in this small opening that we have here on the fence. But there's always a workaround for that. So it turns out that with this one, I can take a 732 hex wrench and I can put it in here, just like the rod, and I can lock it into place. So say that's the height that I want to use. Now what's nice is that I can go over here and I can sneak it in in between the fence posts and I can set the height of my bit according to that. So that's the dual axis depth gauge, height gauge, whichever way. Kind of depends on which way you're orienting it, right? So now let's go back to the groove center. Now it comes in this really kind of fancy box with nice fitted interior. So 
good place to be able to keep it as opposed to tossing it in the drawer. Now what this setup tool is used for is basically taking a measurement of a piece of stock that you want to center the bit on, whichever type of bit you've got. So you would put a piece of stock here, slide the jaw shut and lock it into place. Now there's this half inch cylinder that's down here and what you would do is you would put that into the collet of your router and then there's a fence basically on the front here and that's what you would use to place the fence. So you would just move your fence up until it abuts against the little fence that's on the front here and now you've set it so that for this stock whatever bit you put in that chuck is going to be centered on this edge. Now you notice that we didn't put any bit in there, we didn't measure off of a bit. Since this is determined by the center of the collet, it doesn't matter which one of these bits I put in there now, it's still going to be centered on the edge of the stock. Now again, like most tools, it's got a little tiny graduated ruler on the side here. That'll pretty much get you in the ballpark when you're looking at it to get an idea, gee, is that the one that I put in there? But you're not going to want to set that as your thickness. You're, the whole goal of this is to actually use the stock in order to do the setting. So really what it is, it's a set of gears in here that as you move this carriage here, half the motion is projected out here to the front. Now what if you're not using half inch shank bits? Well it really doesn't matter because I can put in the half inch collet here for doing the setting and placing the fence and then afterwards you could just remove your half inch collet and switch to your quarter inch or your three eighths or do your insert with like a three eighths insert in there. It doesn't matter because actually the very center of that drive shaft is what's been placed the correct distance to center it on the stock. So now if I put a quarter inch up spiral or down spiral in here and I ran this thing vertically like that, I'd get a nice centered groove. That's all great. But where this really works well is using the groove center along with this depth gauge, combining the two together so that you can use the infamous locking miter bit. Now the locking miter bit is a nice bit that it basically makes a mitered corner, 45 degree angles, but then it puts a little tiny tongue on both sides that lock it together so that it makes the box very easy to assemble. It locks itself into place. You don't have sides sliding. And it also gives you a little bit more glue surface. The problem with the locking miter is it's miserable to configure and set up. So usually wherever you're going to find this bit online, you're going to find a recommended accessory of a bunch of setup blocks. Now the setup blocks make it easy, but they also lock you into the thickness of the stock that you're using. And even if you're using plywood, plywood's never the same thickness, at least out here. I don't know if I've ever had two the same. So it'd be nice that a tool like this if you had it, you could use it, of course, for other things, but the setup using these two makes this bit really easy to do. So let me go and we're going to talk about calibrating the groove center, and then I'm going to show you how to use it for using the locking miter. The groove center requires a one-time calibration. Really easy to do. What we're going to do is take this carriage, and we're going to slide it all the way back and lock it into place. Next. This is the position the fence is in normally, horizontal, but for the calibration, we pivot it to vertical. So take the Allen wrench that comes with it in the kit, loosen it up a couple turns, and then it'll rotate. Now it's got a positive detent here so that when you turn it back in, it'll lock it in the vertical position. Now the pin that goes into the collet is also on a slide. Uh, I don't have it all the way loose. And then there's also sort of this stop block here. It's a quick setting block. And we're going to find out the use of that later when we do the calibration for a lock miter when we do that demo. So with these all loose and able to slide, there's a small catch on this bottom piece that grabs the edge of this post that's here. So once you go to push it out, you'll notice that it locks into place and you can't go any further. Basically, that's kind of the setting where we need it. So the way that you're going to do this is when you have this locked and you have this fence post vertical, you're going to flip it upside down and now go to the edge of your router table or a bench or something like that and just give it a light push. I'm not really doing much of anything here. And then you're going to push this pin that goes into the collet. So just give it a light push so that it's going to bump up against that edge of the fence post and then you're going to lock it into place with the Allen wrench. And then we'll go ahead and lock this lock block in there, the sort of stop block, up against the edge. That stop block is there so that you can make some adjustments to this and be able to return it to this calibrated state. Now the reason you want to adjust it out of calibration is when you're doing a lock miter bit, but we'll discuss that later. 
So at this point, you're all calibrated. All you need to do is loosen up the fence again and rotate it into the horizontal position. Now we're all ready to go. This is a one-time calibration. You're not going to need to do it again. Now, if you're curious, these calibration instructions are different than the current ones that are on the website. The difference being on the website, they talk about pushing this out while this is locked back and then locking it into place. Whereas I'm pressing on the fence here. The reason for that, and it's, it's not necessary to know that, but I want you to understand why, is because there's backlash in this whole system. Any gearing system is going to have some backlash. So what happens is that up here, if I were to grab this fence, even though this is locked back at the, at the back fence, I can grab this fence and I can wiggle it forward and backwards. There's, there's flex in there. Now, whenever you're using the groove center, you're always taking the fence and pushing it up against that pin that's in the front. So you're always pushing it back. If you were to do the calibration with this pushed forward and lock it into place, and then when you use it, you push it back, you're going to get an error that is the amount of the backlash. So I, I adjusted the calibration for that because I realized I was getting some small error when I was first playing with the tool. So just make sure you do that, and then this is going to be just perfect. Now when you want to use the groove center with a lock miter bit, you need to get a couple numbers off the lock miter bit. This is also a one-time calibration, in a sense, for each bit that you're going to use. Now these bits come in a variety of sizes. There's some that are made for small jewelry box type projects. This one here is made for standard three-quarter inch ply. And then there are larger ones that deal with more like the one-inch MDF or the one-inch uh, wafer board projects. So if you haven't used a lock miter bit before, basically it's like a chamfer bit that has a tongue and a groove cutter built into the side of it. So when you go to assemble the joint, those the tongue and groove prevents it from wanting to slide. So even though this is a 45 degree angle and there's no glue involved in this, I can push on it and it's not going to slide apart. In fact, this board is from a demo I recorded earlier that you'll see later in this video. Now the two numbers that we need off this lock miter are basically the diameter of this tongue cutter and then of this groove cutter that's in the middle. So we'll use digital calipers in the millimeter setting, just take some readings off that because it's a little bit easier to deal with it in millimeters. So we have 20.6 and 29.75. Now we take those two numbers, add them together, and then divide the sum by four. In this case, we're going to get 12.6 millimeters. So what we're looking for is the average radius of the tongue and the groove cutter. So that's why we take the two diameters, add them together, divide by two gives us the average diameter, and divide it again by two gives us the radius. So let's just sum the two together, divide by four. So just write that on the block here or something, wherever, that you're going to be able to reference it because every time you use this bit, you're going to need to know that number. Now this is where that little stop block comes in to play that's on the back of the groove center. So in order to use the lock miter bit, we're going to loosen the slider that's for the front peg and we're going to set the calipers, the digital calipers, to the number that we came up with, which was 12.6 millimeters in the case of this particular bit, and lock it into place. Now that we have that, we put it between this stop block and the slider, and then we lock it into place. Now, we set up the fence just like we normally would for making the cut. We would put this into the collet. Now, in the case of me, when I was doing this ply, I'll just go ahead and put this back in, squeeze the stock, lock it into place, then we would adjust the fence forward until it bumps up to the fence that's on the groove center and lock it into place. Now I use stop blocks in the back here to lock where the fence is located and I'll explain more why you're going to want to use that when you're using this bit. Now we can remove the groove center because we're done with this. So let me go ahead and put the lock miter bit into the router. Now this is where we get to use the two axis depth gauge. What we're going to want to do is we're going to want to measure the projection of this groove cutter that's here on the lock miter bit relative to the fence. So we're going to put this so it's sticking out as far as it'll go, and then we're going to take and set it according to that. Now it turns out I already had this set. <laughs> now we want to set the height of this bit according to that reading. So we set the depth gauge according to this cutter, and then after that we adjust the height of this bit to that height that we just measured. Now this is where you need to do some eyeballing. What you're setting this to is there's a thickness to that groove cutter that you have on your bit. You're going to want to set it so it's easier if you're using the knife edge of this depth gauge. You're going to want to set it so that the bottom of that knife edge 
is halfway down that uh, groove cutter. So you're just taking an eyeball. Now it turned out that when I was doing it, the error that you would get with it actually is halved because of the way this is working on an angle. It's actually about 60%. So it turns out that with even the thickness of the veneer that we have on this ply, it won't really make a difference if you're you know, a hair off or something like that. So just eyeball it to be halfway down on that groove cutter. So now I have this ready to go to make the cuts. So now that I've recalibrated everything here from scratch, let's see how it compares to the one that came out great yesterday. So if you haven't used the lock miter bit, the way it works is you're gonna run one side flat, and then you're gonna run the other one vertical. And then the two pieces assemble by just pressing them together. Now, if you look at the profile of this, you can see there's actually a lot of wood being removed. If I simply ran it right now on you know, a brand new piece of wood, ran it across there, that is a lot of wood being taken off, and that's a big bit that you're spinning. You're gonna to wanna to run this bit a little bit slower than other bits. But the reason why I have these stop blocks in the back is so that I can advance this fence up, but always get back to my calibrated point. So these are locked into place, so the way that I run this, and you're going to see this in the demo that's added on to the end here, is that I had this loosened up. I pulled this forward. Let me turn this so you can see the projection of it. So I pulled this forward quite a ways, and then I locked it into place. And then I was able to run the board. Now each time I could loosen this up and take it back a little ways. Eventually the final pass is when I go back all the way to these blocks, and then it'll run just fine. Now, in the demo, you saw me run it because I had a single board that I sliced in half. I ran all the flat board over until I was completely done, and then I did the vertical board. Of course, if you have several pieces, you could run the vertical and the flat all at the same time as you're chewing it away to get to your final setup. So speaking of the demos, let's go take a look. First, I'm going to be putting just a simple groove down the center of a piece of some light pine, and then I'm going to be making a lock miter joint in this sapili veneered ply. Let's give it a look. 